Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Frank Griffel, a professor of Islamic studies at Yale University. Professor Griffel teaches courses on the intellectual history of Islam, its theology, and the way Islamic thinkers react to Western modernity. He has published widely in the fields of Islamic theology, Arab and Islamic philosophy, Islamic law, and Muslim intellectual history. Today we'll talk with Professor Griffel about his new book, Al Ghazali's Philosophical Theology. Welcome, Professor Griffel. Glad to be here, Marilyn. So let's start um, with Al Ghazali. Who is he? And then give us an overview of your book. Al Ghazali is one of the most important theologians and overall thinkers in the Islamic world. He's also probably the one author of classical Islam who is most widely read today, and he was most widely read all through the centuries that he had lived. He uh, lived at the turn to the 12th century, mm -hmm. uh, which was in Europe just the end of the Dark Ages. Yet in the Islamic world, it was a time of very lively intellectual activity, both in the natural sciences, in philosophy, as well in theology. Okay. And what led you to write this book? What was your inspiration? Well, I've been fascinated with Al-Ghazali for very many years. Mm -hmm and two reasons. First of all, his importance as an Islamic author, a Muslim theologian, who really formulated to a large degree what was, at least for many centuries, regarded as Islamic orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very important at one point in my life to understand what Islam is, its intellectual history. And at one point, I decided understanding Al-Ghazali helps me a lot in doing so. So it is his importance that triggered me. There was a second aspect that I was also very much interested in, which triggered mostly my interest in, in the book that I just wrote. And that was his position as one might say an angle point between what is the Aristotelian tradition in Islam, something that we call falsafa, philosophy in Islam, mm -hmm. and Islamic theology. He has often been regarded as the thinker who somewhat fought Islamic philosophy or philosophy, Arabic philosophy within Islam and defeated it. And from the very moment I started reading him, I thought that this is not entirely right. And I digged after this and the fruit of it is the book that I just wrote. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about how you did your research. What was your methodology? Well, when you do intellectual history, you basically read books. Mm -hmm. You go to the library, you check out books, you read them once, you read them twice, and very often you read passages 10 times before you really get what these passages mean. In this case of, of writing about Al-Ghazali, I was surprised to what extent actually I also had to deal with manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Because we think that with such an important author, the manuscripts which have, of course, preserved his works to us in the modern period, which were written in the Middle Ages and then later on, that they have now all been turned into printed books. But that was not the case. There was still a great number of texts in the case of Al-Ghazali that still were only in manuscripts and not yet printed. And there was also the issue that many of the prints that we were dealing with were entirely reliable. Mm -hmm. So I actually worked a lot with manuscripts, particularly in European libraries, but also in libraries in the Middle East. Okay. And how does your research differ from the traditional views on Al-Ghazali? I would say the position that I have taken with regard to Al-Ghazali is somewhat a part of a larger re-evaluation of the philosophical tradition in Islam. Mm -hmm. The classical view that was put forward uh, by uh, early, our early great scholars in the field of Islamic, scholar, in Islamic studies who worked mostly at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and this view was then also shared by uh, Arab and Muslim thinkers, uh, was that Islamic ph philosophy in Islam, Arabic philosophy, uh, which was pursued in Islam, was very lively and very active until a certain point in time when the culture somewhat has given up this activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prejudice was that, um, and, and in this case, an occupation more with religious literature, particular with the Quran, actually has replaced 
uh, the rationalist inquiry of the philosophers. By now, we think that this is only half of the story. Mm -hmm. It is true that there was a lively uh, thriving of philosophy of the tradition of Greek philosophy within Islam, but it is also true that at one point, this tradition was turned over, so to speak, from the philosophical discourse to the theological discourse. And my position is that Al-Ghazali actually took a very important position in this turning of philosophy into what we call Kalam literature, which is rationalist theological literature. The traditionalist view, however, is totally different by basically saying that Al-Ghazali destroyed the tradition of falsafa. He, in fact, wrote a very important book which criticizes many teachings of the Arabic philosophers, most importantly amongst them, the philosopher Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avicenna. Uh, and this particular book wasn't very deeply studied. One read the beginning, one read the end, and draw from it the conclusion that it was an all-out refutation of the philosophical tradition, which it clearly wasn't. In fact, it was one part and one parcel, one might say, of the oeuvre of Al-Ghazali, which was, to some degree, criticizing philosophical tradition, yet on the other hand also integrating much of what he does not criticize, in this case, into the Islamic theological discourse. Okay, and what conclusions do you reach in your book? A number of conclusions. Uh, the book is actually mostly concerned with Al-Ghazali's life, mm -hmm. uh, also with Al-Ghazali's students, and then I focus on what is his cosmology. Okay. Let me go through them one by one. Um, with his life, I was surprised to see how, ve how little serious work has been done in the past decades on his life, particular since two new important sources have come up. In this case, his letters, mm -hmm. uh, his Persian letters, which were edited in the 1950s and have not yet had much impact on the secondary literature about his life, despite the fact that they offer a huge amount of insight mm -hmm. about what he was doing, about particular how he felt what he was doing. Secondly, his students, um, one of the problems that scholars who were dealing with the life of Al-Ghazali and his works were always confronted with is that his works are far from being unambiguous. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, in fact, he argues in favor of a certain position, yet in another book he might actually take a position that is opposed to that. Hmm. And my strategy was to look in this case closely into how his students or his early followers write about him and write about his teachings to basically find out how did they think what he truly taught. Mm -hmm. And from there deduce, in a matter of speaking, how he communicated with his students. What he told his students are his, in a matter of speaking, true teachings. And what are the ones that he might have taken at one point in his life, or in this case, how he might in fact reconcile two positions that initially seem to be contradictory. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the main part of the book. This is uh, the third part on cosmology. Now, first, I should probably explain what cosmology is. Yes. Cosmology means uh, 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 how the world, any theory that refers to how the world is constructed. In this particular case, we might talk about our cosmology, for instance, uh, that most of us uh, believe in the existence of a Big Bang. We are convinced, actually, that there was something like a Big Bang, and that from then on, the universe spread. And from then on, we have, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, development of quarks, uh, of neutrinos, of atoms, of molecules. Out of molecules we have bodies. Bodies react in a certain way uh, to causal laws, etc., uh, etc. Et this is what we call cosmology, how actually the universe is constructed. For medieval thinkers, this is closely, this subject is closely connected to how God responds or reacts, or in this case, acts upon his creation. The world is, of course, regarded as God's creation. And here is particular important, how does God create? That is the interesting question there. And there has been developed a particular Islamic view, I might say, which we refer to as occasionalism, which by and large, and I make it short, simply teaches that God creates every object and every, in every moment anew. 
So we might talk, we might think about it as if God, as if this world would be like a film where we have frame after frame after frame after frame and each frame in this case, each moment in itself is newly created. That is one view. And then there is the other view, which is, I would say, probably uh, uh, more uh, closer to our current understanding because it comes from the work of Aristotle in particular, that there are causal laws that determine how things actually react to one another in this world. And that this causal laws, of course, are God's creation and that matter and all these things are also God's creation. And that in a matter of speaking, God creates by means of these causal laws. So far, before I actually finished my book, one might say, or before I uh, came to the, to the main conclusion of my book, people in our field were divided in saying that Al-Ghazali was either one who was totally in favor of the so-called occasionalist view, mm -hmm. where God creates everything in every moment anew, or in favor of the view that God uses so-called secondary causality. God employs causal chains of, mm -hmm. of effects and uh, of uh, causes and effects in order to achieve uh, the goals that he actually wants to achieve in this case, aims to achieve. What I came to conclude is that Al-Ghazali in this case held both views. Mm -hmm. He thought that these two views, although they seem to be contradictory, for him they were not. They would express the same kind of cosmology for him, it was most important to acknowledge that God is the creator of everything in this world, mm -hmm. be it either in the way that he creates everything in every moment anew, or be it, in the, on the other hand, as the starting point of all the causal chains that we actually do see unfolding in this world. Okay. And uh, lastly, what was the most surprising thing you found in doing research for your book? Well, two things, I think. Um, first of all, when I, uh, when I uh, looked into his life, in particular when I looked into his letters and uh, what he writes about his own life, I found out that he was actually born at a day different from what we currently have in all our dictionaries mm. and in all our encyclopedias about him. That, of course, is only a small matter. The other thing that uh, fascinated me is that Al-Ghazali thought about sciences uh, in a very, very modern way. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly even a surprise to me, but it was probably more a surprise to other people who always thought that Al-Ghazali was one of the people who had destroyed the sciences in Islam. Hmm. I think nothing is further from the truth. In fact, he is someone who supported the sciences, who wanted to find a cosmology that actually leads to, first of all, acknowledging God as the creator of the world, but also in, in helping scientists to pursue the sciences. So in a nutshell, one might say he thought in his cosmology, of course, which did not have the Big Bang, but if we would translate his cosmology to the Big Bang as God as the creator of the Big Bang. God created the Big Bang, and from that moment on, all the causes and effects that have unfolded since then with necessity are mediated God's creation. In this case, God deliberately chose, one might say, how to create the Big Bang. And everything that has happened since then is, in this case, a causal effect of this one event that God actually put into this world, which I thought was a very fitting way for a theologian to think about this universe. Very good. Thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your research. My pleasure. For more information about Professor Griffel and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.